In today's video, we're going to look at the Stanford Encyclopedia article on the problem of evil. It's an excellent article by philosopher Michael Tooley, and I'm going to go ahead and have some coffee. I guess we could call this Coffee with Clues. And in the coming months, we're going to be looking at the logical problem of evil and then transition to the evidential problem of evil. So let's take a look at the first two sections of that and just talk through it. Tooley starts out by making some important distinctions and drawing on some important concepts. When we're talking about the problem of evil, we're talking about a God that would be the sort of being that would be worthy of worship and is in some sense ultimate in that regard. And he notes that often we have human desires, such as the desire for uh, goodwill to triumph, over evil, that justice be done. We have a strong desire to see justice done. And we have a strong desire for this life to just not be the end of existence. That is for us to continue, or at least have the possibility of continuing existing post-mortem in an afterlife. So we ask the question, what properties must something have it's, if it's to be an appropriate object of worship? And if it's to provide a reason for thinking that there is a reasonable chance that the fundamental human desires just mentioned will be fulfilled. So obviously God, God needs to be knowledgeable, uh, morally really good. And he has to have the ability with his power to use his knowledge and out of his goodness to prevent unnecessary evils or evils that could be prevented and should be prevented because God is of such a character that God would prevent horrendous evils or just evils in general in order to give his love part of loving his creatures and by showing them goodwill and looking out for their well-being. So when you when you look at that, if you have uh, like these good states in God, omniscience, omnipotence, and being wholly good, and yet you have these bad states of affairs in the world, horrendous evil, pain, suffering, and stuff that looks like just pointless evil isn't serving any overarching good or preventing a worse evil, then there's a straightforward way to formulate the first pass at a problem of evil. So he says here, one, if God exists, then God is omnipotent, omniscient, and morally perfect. Two, if God is omnipotent, then he has the power to eliminate all evil. Three, if God is omniscient, then God knows when evil exists. Four, if God is morally perfect, then God has the desire to eliminate all evil. And yet, five, evil exists. Six, if evil exists and God exists, then either God doesn't have the power to eliminate all evil, or doesn't know when evil exists, or doesn't have the desire to eliminate all evil. But we just said, if you go back up to one, if God exists, God has all those attributes. So the fact that if evil exists entails that God doesn't have at least one of those omni attributes means that such a God, the ultimate um, reality in terms of perfections of power, knowledge, and goodness won't exist because God has to have those character traits essentially such that if there's, for instance, evil and God doesn't know about it, then he doesn't have all true propositions. He doesn't have perfect uh, knowledge of all truths. So he's not omniscient. But that means that such a God, an ultimate being that's ultimately worthy of worship and is able to rectify injustices and so on, does not exist. Now, this article, this, this uh, article, <laughs> this argument is just like the classic logical problem of evil. It's sort of a J.L. Mackey style, original J.L. Mackey style problem of evil. And 
it of course is subject to the free will um, defense. Briefly, without getting in, into the weeds, um, God would give creatures free will because it's so valuable. But by giving creatures free will, and here we're talking about libertarian free will, free will, which is the ability to, to at the moment of choice, to choose one way or the other, um, so you're not determined, and it's, it's the sort of often called significant freedom, because you could have gone one way or the other, and it was up to you. It wasn't just all the causal forces and the laws of nature determining you uniquely to go one way. So given that valuable thing that we have free will, that we can love people freely, and it's such a great good, that then it's logically possible that in, that at least in some possible world, creatures don't use sort of misuse that freedom and do evil. And given a bunch of other details about trans world depravity and so on, the, the gist of it is that the existence of an omni God is compatible logically with the presence of some evil. And so therefore the argument as stated in the original logical form fails. Now, most apologists, as many people have pointed out, and I just had a friend on Facebook point this out, which is, is very uh, perceptive and very needed, is that apologists often stop right there and say, well, wait a minute, the logical problem of evil really isn't a problem because, you know, um, Plantinga showed that it fails the strong logical deductive version. But there are other logical problems of evil that have cropped up that are actually pretty powerful. One that we're going to be talking about in the coming months is Jim Sturba's logical problem of evil. And it's he's he went and headed, uh, has vetted it or had his idea exposed to many different philosophical uh, perspectives and objections, as recently shown in that uh, religions special issue. I know there's problems with that journal. Don't worry. But as I said, this is a, uh, a gym in the midst of a bunch of garbage, 40 contributors. He goes and responds to all of them. And uh, so he's definitely exposed this argument to a lot of critical pressure. You may think in the end it doesn't work, but it at least is taken very seriously by philosophers. And it's something that needs to be con contended with. So when you hear people that are pop apologists say, oh, the logical problem of evil, it's been solved. How am planning to solve that with this free will defense? He solved one version of the logical problem of evil, but there's other versions that have cropped up that are powerful. So let's take a look at, actually, let's skip forward to an important point in the next section. And that is axiological versus deontological formulate, formula, formulations. <laughs> no, I can really talk. I need some more coffee. Hey, this is coffee with clues. What am I doing? I've been talking too much. I need to start drinking coffee. All right. Let's take a look at this axiological versus deontological form, formulations. So... Here's the abstract like version of the argument from evil that we just went through in section 1.1 that focuses on concrete types of evil. So in, in 1.3, he was talking about concrete evil versus sort of general evil. But you can, you can focus on particular instances or types of evil, and that can often strengthen your problem of evil. So here's here's one that uses concrete instances of pro of suffering and pain in its formulation. So look at one. There exists states of affairs in which animals die agonizing deaths in forest fires. It's classic rose fawn in the forest. Um, or where children undergo lingering suffering and eventual death due to cancer. And that A, are intrinsically bad or undesirable, and B, 
are such that any omnipotent person has the power to prevent them without thereby either allowing an equal or greater evil or preventing an equal or greater good. Okay, that's kind of a mouthful, but let me just let me just make a, a personal point really quickly. Um, it's easy in looking at the problem of evil to focus strictly on the intellectual problem and lose track of the emotional problem. I don't think that when you're someone's going through the emotional problem of evil and they're having an existential crisis of faith and how could a good God allow such pain and suffering? It's not good to mention, you know, Hey, logically speaking, it's God's existence is compatible with the presence of evil and your pain and suffering. That's not helpful. But I do think the opposite is helpful. That is when we're working in the intellectual mode, it's good to just have in the background or keep in mind the emotional problem of evil because that can motivate and deepen our drive to uh, seek a greater understanding for how uh, all this evil in the world can exist and still there be a perfectly good God. So I just say this because I just recently had, uh, there's a person I follow on YouTube that uh, was a chiropractor, doctor. I've got back pain. He does back pain stuff, but then he got cancer. And uh, two days ago, he finally passed from his cancer. And he was such an amazing guy. And he had a huge impact on this community of people that rallied around him. But it, it seems like, man, why would a good, I mean, God knows about this, right? And God is good and God has the power. So, so why would God allow, you know, cancer in him and, and, or especially children as, as Tuli mentioned. So I just want to pause. I think it's important to connect the head and the heart in these matters, especially in the problem of evil. So with that in mind, let's just jump back into some of the specifics uh, that are intrinsically bad or undesirable. So children suffering from cancer in the pain and, and all the chemo and all that is intrinsically bad or at least unders undesirable. And it, God could prevent them. It seems like, like, couldn't God prevent that child from dying of cancer at a very young age without like allowing some other horrible evil, evil to occur? Um, or like preventing a greater good, like just seems like, I, I mean, maybe God could bring a ton of great stuff out of that. Maybe the case I was just mentioning is a case in point. This guy had a huge impact on people. And so maybe God permitted him to suffer cancer and die because there was this great good that came out of it. But especially when it comes to kids that, that uh, have very few connections, they aren't making a global impact or a big impact around the world. It just seems like, man, God could have prevented that, right? Now we get two for any state of affairs that is actual. The existence of that state of affairs is not prevented by anyone. Just basically, if you have a state of affairs in the actual world, then no one's prevented that state of affairs from occurring because it's been actualized. Three, for any state of affairs and any person, if that state of affairs is intrinsically bad, child suffering with cancer, and that person has the power to prevent that state of affairs without, you know, again, allowing a, a worse evil or preventing a greater good. And here I'm just letting go of the equal part. <laughs> just to, for ease of clarification, um, it's equal or greater, um, or equal, you know, equal or greater. We'll just understand is greater, but does not do so. Then that person is both is not both omniscient and morally perfect. So you could have a less than morally perfect agent that allows bad stuff to happen. That seems plausible, but if you're going to say morally perfect, then why would God allow intrinsically evil or bad states of affairs to occur 
a good God would want to eliminate those. Um, and so from one, two, and three, we get basically there's no omni God. And then, and then if God exists, then then he's omnipotent, blah, 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 blah. Okay, God doesn't exist. Okay, that argument's deductively valid. And here's a little tidbit, little tip from Cluse. Better get some more coffee here. Click on the old proof button and you go deep into the logic. Whoa, okay. So <laughs> Dooley, Dooley works it out. So if you want to challenge yourself, I laugh, but actually it's a good exercise uh, with logic to actually work through the deduction and see that it's logically valid. I mean, you can see that it's logically valid because you know it's following logically valid forms of, of deductive arguments, but that's, that's different than proving that it's valid, right? So if you want to work through the proof, as you can see here, you can go to town and, uh, and we've, we've got, um, predicate logic. We got the whole thing. This is really good actually. So look, look, look at, this is what it takes to actually <laughs> prove that an argument is deductively valid. But we can go back. I'm just, I just showed you that little tip there if you want to go deeper. So then we can ask, how could this be justified? How could that claim about God preventing or eliminating all intrinsically bad states of affairs, how could that be justified? And the claim is, well, like, this would maximize the good, right? So if you took on board a consequentialist understanding of, of ethics, then God would be morally justified in eliminating such bad states of affairs because it would maximize the good intuitively with a lot of caveats, but that's kind of the general idea. But then the difficulty, as he says, then is that any such assumption is likely to be deeply controversial and one that many theists would reject. So most theists would not be straightforward consequentialists, although it's kind of funny that, um, one of the big proponents of utilitarianism, a brand of consequentialism, was J.S. Mill, John Stuart Mill. And he actually thought pretty clearly that uh, theism was compatible with utilitarianism. Now, that can be questioned in contemporary ethics. That's not the case. Obviously, you have someone like Peter Singer, well-known atheist, and derives from his utilitarianism consequences that no Christian would necessarily accept, but you, there's no, there's no in principle reason that consequentialism would be off the table. However, consequentialism by itself is deeply controversial. And so you don't want to tie your logical problem of evil on justifying a step in it, step three, to a highly controversial assumption. Now, one thing that is very good about Jim Sturba's logical problem of evil, which we're going to get to in, in future videos, is that he makes sure in his formulation to say this moral principle would be acceptable to both consequentialists and non-consequentialists -cons alike. So he builds into his logical problem of evil, or, or at least notes in his logical problem of evil, that this isn't baking in a controversial assumption, such as a consequentialist assumption, to justify why it would make sense for God to get rid of all undesirable or intrinsically bad states of affairs. So the problem is, in short, that any axiological formulation of the argument from evil is incomplete in a crucial respect since it fails to make explicit how a failure to bring about good states of affairs or a failure to prevent bad states of affairs entails that one is acting in a morally wrong way. And that would be required in order to to call into question the moral perfection or the goodness of God, because God wouldn't do what's morally wrong. But you would need that in your 
um, this version of the problem of evil, if you formulate it in axiological terms, you could get sidetracked, uh, such as the question of whether God would be morally blameworthy if he failed to create the best world. And so this is why at least Thule suggests you we go with a deontological formulation of the problem of evil. Here the idea is that rather than employing concepts that focus upon the value or disvalue of states of affairs, one instead uses concepts that focus on the rightness and wrongness of actions and upon the properties, right-making and wrong-making properties, that determine whether an action is one that ought to be performed or ought not to be performed. When the argument is thus formulated, there is no problematic bridge that needs to be introduced connecting the goodness and badness of states of affairs with the rightness and wrongness of actions, right? So instead of saying, like, there are these bad states of affairs, and somehow that generates what's morally wrong, if God allows for these states of affairs, then you avoid that by just focusing on the deontic properties. Again, deontology, or at least deontic properties when we're talking about morality, are the, the three properties in terms of uh, moral requirement, an action, if an action is morally required, then if you were to fail to do it, you would have done something wrong. Moral permissibility, such that it's okay to do the action, but if you fail to do it, you don't do something morally wrong. And then you have moral prohibition, such that if you do something you ought not to have done, then you have also done something wrong. Now let's go ahead and take a look at the last section. We're going to talk about section two, which is the choice between incompatibility formulations and evidential formulations. So now you'll notice just quickly, as we talked about earlier, you might think, why, why is Thule gone back on his word and, and is talking about evidential as opposed to inductive? Now later he does talk about inductive, and so he clearly means evidential in terms of the inductive versions. But remember, there can be evidential versions that are probabilistic, but ultimately are deductive. So... Uh, but they won't be deductive in the incompatibility sense. That is, they won't just have um, sets of propositions that are, are together entail that there can't exist God. Okay, so I just, just mentioned that as a, a brief aside. So there was a problem with that first version that we talked through in the uh, section 1.1, and that was the, the basic sort of Mackian original pass version of the problem of evil, um, which is number four. Uh, if God is morally perfect, then God has the desire to eliminate all evil. Now, the problem with that premise, and you know, one reason why that arg argument was uh, set aside is because it's at least logically possible that God's morally perfect and yet doesn't have the desire to eliminate all evil. God might allow for free will, and that might be so valuable that it's by God giving people free will, it's at least logically possible that in some possible world, someone misuses that free will and does evil. So it's not the case that for God to be morally perfect, God will have the desire to eliminate all evil. It's logically possible that at least some evil is can exist and God can exist, right? So that was the problem with that one. Uh, in section 1-4, we had a, a concrete version that we just talked through of an incompatibility argument that appealed which rather than appealing to the mere existence of evil, it appealed to specific types like situations where animals die, children undergo suffering and uh, death due to cancer. And then so the thrust of that, it, first of all, an omniscient and omnipotent person could have prevented the existence of such evils without thereby allowing greater evils to occur or permitting like greater goods that could have occurred. 
And then secondly, that any omniscient and morally perfect person would prevent the existence of such evils if that can be done without allowing uh, for greater evils or preventing greater good. The second of these claims, as he says, avoids the objection that can be directed against the stronger claim, as in 1-1, one, one, that is, the claim that if God is morally perfect, then God has the desire to eliminate all, all evil, but the shift to the more modest claim requires that you move from the very modest claim that evil exists to the stronger claim that there are certain evils you're getting more specific, such that uh, an omniscient, omnipotent person could have prevented the existence of such evils without thereby allowing for greater evil or, or preventing greater goods. So how would you go about establishing via just a purely deductive argument that the deer's suffering or the child's cancer could have been, you know, was logically, <clears throat> wasn't not logically necessary to achieve a greater good or to avoid a greater evil. As he says, if one had knowledge of the totality of morally relevant properties, then it might well be possible to show both that there's no greater evils that can be avoided, only at the cost of the evil in question. So you have the cancer, and then if you knew all the morally relevant properties, you could say there's no greater evil that would be allowed you know, by, by, um, not by preventing this <clears throat> and then, uh, or no greater goods that are possibly possible only given that evil. So you have the evil and then how could you scan and say, well, there's no greater good that, that could have come out of allowing for this evil. And again, that seems hard to do. Do you have such knowledge? And some moral theorists claim we do, and that is possible to set out like a complete and correct moral theory. But this is certainly a highly controversial meta-ethical claim. And so the prospects for establishing a premise such as one via a deductive argument don't appear as promising, at least given the present state of moral theory. But if one can't establish one by a deductive argument from one's moral theory, if one cannot do that, cannot it be argued that will cannot it be argued that will lead to skepticism? What? <clears throat> but if one cannot establish one by a deductive argument, cannot it be argued that that will lead to skepticism about whether can know one can know what human actions are morally right and morally wrong? Okay, that was, that was a convoluted sentence. He's just saying, like, if you can't establish one <clears throat> by a deductive argument from your moral theory, can't you say, well, this is going to bleed over into general skepticism? And, you know, maybe knowledge of moral right and wrong is just completely ruled out. But as what he's, he says, as will become clear <clears throat> when we consider the evidential versions, it may well be that one can have justified beliefs, short of knowledge, about the rightness and wrongness of actions. So if a premise such as one cannot be established deductively, then the only possibility, it would seem, is to offer some sort of inductive argument for the support of the relevant premise. But if this is right, then it is surely best to get that crucial inductive step out into the open and thus formulate the argument from evil, not as a deductive argument for the very strong claim that it's logically impossible for both God and evil to exist, <clears throat> but as an evidential inductive or probabilistic argument for the more modest claim that there are evils that actually exist in the world that make it unlikely that God exists and that we can be justified in believing that. So I'd love to hear your thoughts. I just wanted to talk through. I know that was a little rambly, but I hope it was helpful. It's helpful to work through this stuff. And I'd love to hear your thoughts. What are your thoughts about the first version that we talked about? Um, what do you think about the difference between the axiological and the deontological formulations? And then what do you think 
is there still a logical problem of evil that works or is worth taking seriously? And again, I mentioned uh, Sturba's example because he formulates in a way that's uh, neutral between moral theories and neutral between atheists and theists, at least he thinks. So at least that makes it stronger as a first pass for a logical problem of evil because you're not tying it directly to the need for endorsing a controversial moral theory to get from God allowing or there being present these certain bad things to it being morally wrong for God to allow them such that God isn't morally perfect if these things exist, right? So that, that would be necessary. But if you can just say that, hey, this is an assumption, this is a very modest assumption that consequentialists, non-consequentialists, theists and atheists alike can all endorse, then you're on much stronger footing. And that's why Sturba's logical problem of evil is more powerful than these versions. So perhaps we don't need to jump right away to an evidential problem, although we do need to bring out the inductive step. So I hope this is helpful. Smash the like button, do all the youtube -y stuff, subscribe, keep thinking critically about Christian theism, keep striving toward uh, living that Christian philosophical life.